And I believe in freedom. I believe in young people. I believe in courage. I believe in making mistakes and, and uh, taking responsibility for yourself. I can't lose. That's, that's the tide of history. That's freedom. <laughs> Why do you think you were sent to prison? Well, they said that I was the number one enemy to the uh, Judeo-Christian adult authority that was running the hive at the moment, namely J. Edgar Hoover, <laughs> Spiro Agnew, remember him? <laughs> Richard Nixon, you wonder why they put me in jail? <laughs> the reason was, of course, that uh, the Nixon administration had told the American people the number one uh, corrupting influence and danger to the American way of life is drugs. And he was absolutely right. Now, he couldn't do anything about it. The more he talked about drugs, the more billions of dollars he put into his army of narcs that went around the world bothering people, more and more people were taking drugs. So he had no successes to show, but if he could arrest uh, what he and his colleagues thought was the spokesperson or the leading figures, I was a symbol of it. That's what I think. What do you think? <laughs> What was happening the night that Nixon resigned to you? Did you think there would be a great deal of change? Uh, well, we knew back, uh, any sensible uh, observer of the human situation knew in 1968 that it was going to be a reaction, that the adult authority, the older generation, was really angry that the young people refused to grow up and be like them. So Nixon and Reagan were both elected on the campaign of crush the kids, uh, stop the uh, dissent in the colleges. We all know that. So um, it, was, it was inevitable that you had that reaction, and it was also inevitable that that kind of reaction wouldn't hold, because basically the American people don't want a government of uh, spies and uh, wiretapping. We don't want a government that's drafting our kids and sending them off. Uh, we don't want a government of narcotics agents busting into middle-class people's houses. Uh, it's, it's, it, everything about that was against the American way of life. We knew that reaction would happen. We knew that it would... Uh, uh, end and we knew that the uh, time is on my side i'm just going to throw out a few subjects if you'd care to respond well television now is in the hands of the adult establishment and it, television is 99 percent dedicated to keep you dumb and stupid lsd is one of the most important discoveries uh, that the human being ever made it's the key to changing your own brain now that's perhaps one out of a thousand maybe one out of ten thousand people who are mature enough and self-confident enough uh, to be able to use this. Particularly back in the 60s, at the height of the Judeo-Christian empire, when we were s sending good Christians over to Vietnam and so forth, LSD was uh, a very powerful revolutionary uh, device, giving people control of their own brains. But um, uh, I've never advocated it. it you can't advocate the telescope, you can't advocate the, mi the microscope, you can't advocate uh, uh, nuclear fusion. Before the 1960s, there was no notion of pleasure. You uh, worked five days a week, six days a week, and on Saturday nights you were allowed to get drunk and bump up and down your wife for reproductive purposes, maybe. There was no notion of pleasure. Pleasure was something that was owned by the priests and the, the big guys in the sky. Well. Um, for every little pleasure, there's a pain, pain, pain. That's what they taught us back then. Well, now pleasure is our number one business. So don't tell me that nothing happened in the 60s. The 60s have taken over. By pleasure, I mean self-indulgence, self-actualizing, recreation, recreational vehicles, going and coming where you want to, private airplanes, waterbeds, all this new sensuality, the new emphasis on uh, aesthetics, uh, Joe Namath with a hair dryer in the locker room. The key to religion the key to find God is intelligence. It's not obedience. It's not submission. It's not falling on your knees. What's wrong with you falling on your knees? Do you think, do you worship a God that wants you on your knees like slaves? The new religions are going to glorify intelligence because God wants us to be intelligent because the smarter we are, the more we'll understand her handiwork and the glories of uh, the uh, galaxies that she's built. So definitely the, <coughs> the new religion is going to be a religion of intelligence. If, you're, if you increase your intelligence, you're sexier. If you increase your intelligence, <coughs> you're more romantic. If you increase your intelligence, um, you're more religious because obviously the smarter you are, the more you want to know exactly who did it, 
who created us, and how she wants this to evolve. People are much smarter today. The very fact that I'm saying these things on a, on a uh, regional television is a sign of sophistication and growth. People couldn't say this 10 years ago, uh, and people are listening. A third of the people that listen to this uh, broadcast are going to think it over and are going to take some steps in, uh, in self-actualization, throwing out the two or three thousand year old heritage of submission and fear and guilt and sin and devil and all that nonsense, which is designed to keep you stupid and to keep you frightened. <laughs> A cult is simply a small version of what in larger uh, extent becomes the sacred holy cow. Christianity was a cult. One time there were 12 kind of hippy-dippy fishermen following Christ. Was it a cult then? The Roman, uh, the Roman Empire and the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin thought Christianity was a cult. Uh, anyone that invites you to follow a leader is asking you to submit, to go on your knees. Don't follow any leaders. Uh, cults, if you mean by cult, a, uh, a religious group following a charismatic leader giving money and obedience and submission, well, I'm totally opposed to that. I hate followers. I've never had any followers. But what I've done throughout my history, anytime someone wants to follow me, I do everything possible to alienate them. When the vegetarians come around, I eat meat. <laughs> when, <laughs> when the Buddhists come around, we open up champagne, with, don't we, Barbara? When the, <laughs> when the druggies come around, we tell them they're taking too much drugs. Leave us alone. We don't want followers around. It's time again, I think, after the 60s, a little wedding period, for people to start speaking up again and shocking people. I want to shock people that are listening to this. I want to make you think. I want to get you arguing among yourselves in your own living room the way you used to do in the 60s. I want the kids to be arguing with their grown-ups. Avoid adult, terminal adulthood, young people who are watching this. Don't grow up like your parents. Argue about it. Let's get some sparks and electricity going again because they're all a little too laid back. It's time to, uh, it's a great American tradition of speaking up and challenging and stirring things up because no change takes place in the brain unless there's shock. There's some sort of a electrical explosion that shakes you up a little. It's not going to hurt you either. To hear a different point of view is not going to bring down the, <laughs> the walls of the Mormon temple or the <laughs> local churches. <laughs>